Hello and welcome. My name is Daniel Peabody and I'm a director here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery. I wanna thank you for joining us this evening for our virtual opening of our exhibitions for the month of October. Um, Elizabeth Leach Gallery is in Portland, Oregon. We're at 417 Northwest 9th Avenue and we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 1030 to 530. Uh, by appointment or chance, if you're in the neighborhood, just knock on the door. If you want to schedule an appointment to come in and see our exhibitions, uh, please call the gallery at 503-224-0521 or email art at elizabethleach.com. Um, our exhibitions this month are by Mark R. Smith, uh, an exhibition titled Phalanxes. It's new work. That exhibition is on view October 1st through November 28th. And also on view, which you're seeing on the screen currently, is an exhibition by Jeremy Okai Davis entitled Black Wood, uh, New Paintings. And that show is on view October 1st through October 31st. Um, on, on October 17th, uh, Saturday, October 17th, Jeremy Okai Davis will do a exhibition tour in conversation with curator Larry Osa Munsa. And uh, we have that to look forward to. There will be um, an email. So watch your email for that and announcements for that. Um, right now, what we're looking at is our first exhibition with Portland artist, Jeremy Okai Davis. Um, and for this exhibition, Jeremy is exploring underappreciated or underrepresented African-American and black artists, actresses, singers from the 1950s many of whom were featured on Jet Magazine. Um, currently, those images are um, Blackwood Diana Dickerson and Blackwood Marlene Fitzhugh and uh, Nellie, Wo Nellie Hill, excuse me. Um, and if you go circling to the left, um, you'll see um, another piece called Sepia um, and uh, continuing around the exhibition to the left, um, there are some additional paintings, uh, Toulouse and Aisha. And then on the other end of the gallery, um, there are additional paintings also by Jeremy Okai Davis. Um, we'll be looking forward to this conversation with him and Larry Osa Mensa on, again, on Saturday, October 17th. Um, and with us tonight, um, we will be talking with Mark R. Smith and Linda Tesner. Um, and Mark R. Smith got his BFA from the Cooper Union in New York City and his MFA from Portland State University. In the autumn of 2018, he had an exhibition at the Hoffman Gallery at Lewis and Clark College titled Loss of Material Evidence, which was a collaboration with his wife and collaborator, Maria in Innocencio. Um, that exhibition was curated with, by Linda Tesner, and so we are excited to have them here in conversation this evening. Um, that exhibition was accompanied by a catalog, which is quite fantastic, so hopefully you've had a chance to check that out. Past exhibition highlights by Mark Smith include inclusion in three Oregon biennials at the Portland Art Museum in 1995, 1997, and 2001. And he has shown with Elizabeth Leach Gallery for 25 years. We're very excited to have this exhibition, Phalanxes, on view October 1st through November 28th. Um, additional highlights from Mark's career include commissions for Lewis and Clark College here in Portland, a commission for Oregon Department of Transportation in Salem, the Port of Portland, and TriMet. There's a fantastic public piece on the TriMet um, Transit Mall in downtown Portland. And he's, his work can be found in numerous collections, including Nike, in Corp, uh, Nike here in Beaverton, the American Embassy in Accra, Ghana, and I just had the opportunity to tour the new Multnomah County Central Courthouse here in Portland, and he has a wonderful piece that from his exhibition that was a collaboration with his wife, Maria Inocencio, that's part of that collection. 
So in a moment, you'll help join me in welcoming Mark Smith to the for the evening. Um, and then in conversation with Mark and I this evening will be Linda Tesner, who's an independent curator and writer and consultant. Uh, her prior professional positions have included the interim director of the Jordan Schnitzer, Schnitzer Museum of Art at Portland State University and uh, director and curator of the Rana and Eric Hoffman Gallery of Contemporary Art at Lewis and Clark College, which she held for 20 years. She previously held positions at the Portland Art Museum and the Mary Hill Museum. And PAC's past exhibition highlights curated by Linda include Eric Stodick, Allison Saar, Dana Lynn Lewis, Stephen Hayes, Darren Waterston, Michael Knutson, and the 20 year anniversary of Bonnie Bronson Fellows. Please join me in welcoming both Mark and Linda. Welcome. Hey. Hi. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk a bit about Mark's exhibition and what you're seeing uh, in the view right here is his exhibition Phalanxes. And the, uh, Mark, you can tell us a bit about this exhibition, but it's so interesting that you've been looking back at social collectivism movements, utopian societies, all these uh, theoretical um, social experiments from the 1800s. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more as we walk through, but I look forward to um, hearing the conversation uh, between the two of you and um, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Can I go ahead and, and jump right on in? Please, please do. Um, I, I'm really excited that we're starting with this beautiful piece called Sutured Square that you can see on the right hand side. Um, Mark, I, I think I maybe have mentioned this to you before, but I always respond to your work first from a totally aesthetic uh, perspective. I just, um, I take great joy in seeing your work. I'm always just really interested in the imagery from a purely visual standpoint. And then when I'm able to get, get down underneath the visual and talk with you about the context or the foundations that buttress your, ex, your, your work, um, I'm always very excited to learn more about uh, where these ideas come from. But when I first saw this piece um, on your viewing room, I thought like, oh my gosh, that's a portrait of our country. Uh, we are, as we all know, we are all grappling with the idea that our country is now so horribly polarized. Um, and then of course, you've got a, a zipper right down the front of this canvas. Um, so the two halves are literally sutured together. And uh, the word suture makes me think about something that's been broken or fractured or, or um, wounded. Um, is, did that have anything to do with your ideas when you were making this piece? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I can give, uh, if I can just step back a little bit and give some context. The, so the show is called Phalanxes and it is, um, Phalanx comes, uh, it's terminology from one of the utopian societies from the 19th century. Um, and it was, um, it was originated by a, a social philosopher named Charles Fourier, you know, uh, lived in France. This was, he was born in the 1700s and lived into the early to mid 1800s. Anyway, he, uh, he envisioned an idealized um, colony never realized in Europe, but actually there were some attempts in the US and he called them, uh, he called them phalanxes and uh, basically formations. If you, look, if you go to the dictionary and look up phalanx, it means it's a formation. And I was really interested in that term because um, I, I associate phalanxes with something aggressive, sort of militaristic, mm -hmm. you know, like military formations. So then I was interested in how how the, the word in his mind, how he would regard that the idea of a formation of people and then how that how that has kind of evolved or the content of that meaning has evolved um, over the centuries. So uh, that was a starting point. And uh, also with this notion that that, you know, I, I've just always been interested in, in uh, you know, utopian societies. Uh, communities, communistic societies where people work as a whole for the betterment of, of each individual. And then there's like a little give and take, one sacrifices a little bit for the whole. And I thought that was, <laughs> it was pretty good metaphor for the situation that we find ourselves in contemporary, you know, right at this moment. Yes. And so absolutely, it's, it's, it is about this kind of fracture. 
There's a, uh, a certain uh, yeah. vis visual uh, discord in these two these two pairs coming together. I I want to like I want to unzip the zipper and see what's behind the mask a little bit. Like one of these days, are we going to like, is Donald Trump going to unzip his costume and out will pop an alien? Um, but it, I'm very curious about the zipper idea too because that that harkens back to previous work that you've done. Um, the game bags, for example, uh, the stuffed sculptures. But I feel like here the zipper is very purposeful and it's very much uh, an element, a, a formal element in the construction of the, of the painting. Well, absolutely. And, and it, it, feels, it feels natural because the, the, the work emerged from clothing. It's all clothing, it's mm -hmm. all textile. So the, the zipper is just another component. Uh, but it, uh, I, I came to regard it in this context as, as like a, a sutures, like there these two mm -hmm. halves being forcibly uh, put together, and um, and maybe you know, uh, maybe not gracefully, but forcibly put together, mm -hmm. so that there is a whole, there is some sort of sense of resolution, even though you have these two very disparate parts, and so the zipper is kind of the this, uh, it's this suture that just holds things together. And, yes. and kind of we're in this moment where, you know, that just has to work. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, before we before we start talking about Charles Fourier, um, would you mind talking a little bit about your materials, like how you source your materials, uh, the fact that they're all, um, all of these works are made from found objects, that is textiles. Um, I'd love to have you, like for anybody that doesn't understand what these paintings are made of, I think that would be worth mentioning how these paintings are made. Yeah, sure, well, um, maybe we can, sorry, don't interrupt. Um, let's zoom in a little bit and look at the textile so that we can um, we can see that. And then um, I would do we'll also just mention while I'm, while I'm talking, this is reclaimed textiles on a wooden panel and it's 60 by 60 inches. But please, please, please carry on. Right, so everything, everything you see there at one time was a stripe on a t-shirt or a tablecloth or a curtain or you know a skirt uh, of some kind uh, they tend they're they're woven like knit fabrics and then they're just basically dismantled um, I find them in the bins and then they're dismantled and then they're 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 as assembled into these designs uh, in these kind of concentric fig configurations and over over the years it's just become a vocabulary for me I just mm -hmm. enjoy the fact I like the material I respond to it um, I'm responsive in the way that I don't feel like I want to invent the color or the thing. Mm -hmm. I want to find it and then respond to it and then mm -hmm. manipulate it. And those things are just out there. And I like, I like uh, capturing them and kind of, you know, uh, reconfiguring them, making them into a different kind of whole. Mm -hmm. I suppose with, in, in, in relation to these utopian societies, it was, it was really crucial that, um, that, that, if you lived in a community like a communistic society, and in, in say in the early mid 1800s, people had to be self-sufficient. If you banded together, that became very important. So every community would have a textile mill, along with uh, you know a, a, a grain a granary, um, and um, and then also a, you know um, a, a forgery and and a forge. So these the textile mill was very important, and that's how people also conducted commerce, um, they could produce things that they could uh, sell outside the community, not, not just you know, um, for themselves, but they would were able to actually build capital by selling, selling goods, and, and they happen to be often textiles. I really want to talk more about this idea of a utopian society, and I was wondering if we could go to something like Ideal Pairs, one of the, um, one of the pieces that reminds me of your earlier uh, termite painting, termite mound paintings. This is a good one. Yeah. Well, so they're they're both they're both working on this idea of symmetry. And it's symmetry is just a very seductive thing. And 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 one I think aspires to some kind of symmetry. It, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, you know, like a um th there's something just really fascinating and uh, meditative about trying to work with symmetry. And then of course when you when you adhere to perfect symmetry, often it becomes very static and very, you know, there's there's nothing going on. So um, I was drawn to the idea of exploring symmetry, but then 
but then altering it. So these are basically mm -hmm. uh, these, both of those images are mirrored. There's a left side, a right side, and they look kind of the same, but then they're not. Mm -hmm. They're uh, something almost a little bit opposite. Nothing is exactly the same. Not No one little unit is the same. And in terms of the, the inspiration uh, for these pieces, in, in uh, Charles Fourier's ideal idealized community, there was perfect symmetry, not only in the architecture, but amongst the individuals. So he, he visualized that there were, uh, he hypothesized that there were um, 810 different personality types. And so then an ideal, um, uh, an ideal colony or community would have uh, uh, equal, it'd have a pair of each uh, personality types uh, so that they would better harmonize. So um, there was always going to be a complementary um, uh, personality type or individual uh, for each member in that colony. Now, you know, very aspirational, hard to realize, but it was kind of an interesting concept to then try to visualize in, in art. But the goal was, was toward achieving a kind of a type of harmony. You know, when you say aspirational, like that's such a, a, a positive word. It seems so kind of preposterous to me that you could um, somehow formulaically pair people in such a way that you're matchmaking them to be, um, you know, living, not, not romantic partners, but living partners. But there were, Fourier is a very interesting person. I'd never heard of him before. Um, I was really interested to hear about his ideas around gender equality and um, parity between the sexes, um, between all members of the society. Do you, mind, do you mind talking about that a little bit? Because I think that that, um, in, in many ways, works such as these seem like visual metaphors for like the idea of, of um, individuality within a whole. Well, he was living in France at the time of the revolution and there was, you know, there was movement towards democracy with many fits and starts because there were several waves of revolution. And he lived through that turmoil and he, in the city, he, he experienced firsthand how people suffered, working people suffered um, tremendously. And um, the very kind of the, the person perhaps who bared the most, uh, th who bared the brunt uh, in, 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 in all of this, um, in, in all of this social turmoil was the married, uh, the married woman, the mother, the mother kind of the, the at that time, the, the person who had to sort of uh, hold the family together. Mm -hmm. And um, and you were essentially a servant to your family, and so he uh, he saw how women suffered under those circumstances, and then just visualized this this kind of society where women weren't necessarily tethered to their family, where the family became a kind of a larger entity, um, and and there were other people to kind of you know um, um, help help to. Uh, you know, take charge of things and manage. And so uh, people were encouraged uh, to really follow their interests and their, uh, their, their particular, you know, explore their particular interests and, and develop their own skills. And women weren't, uh, women weren't required to, you know, so be working in so-called kitchen or, you know, doing the domestic things, you know, one was free to do what they wanted. Um, and, then, and of course, he's he's hypothesizing because we know that didn't necessarily happen. But that's why I keep saying it was aspirational. <laughs> yes. Well, you think about uh, maybe 20th or 21st century ideas of these sorts of utop utopian um, collaborative communities, like the the hippie commune in the 60s, or a, or kibbutz living in Israel. And, and I just always wonder, does it really ever work? Um, but uh, I want to know how you came across Fourier, and and I'm very curious to know how you do your research that informs your next body of work, because I I always notice that you really you love a good taxonomy, and you love a good system, um, and I'm I'm very curious to know how you were led to his philosophies and his ideas, and so much so that you you know spent significant time reading about them. Well, um, I've I've had I've been interested in uh, utopian communities for a long time, just in the sense that that they're you know uh, their social organisms is this sort of um, desired um, 
harmony within a, a, a particular community. I, early on, when I was making work, it was uh, it had to do with these um, uh, social organism insect colonies because yes. they were they were they were perfect. They all cooperated and they all worked in harmony. And then that evolved into kind of looking, you know, or using that as a metaphor for mm -hmm. how people got along with one another. Actually, so the, just, yeah. the phalanstery really reminds me of that, like a, an intimate city, that beautiful public piece that you did for Lewis and Clark College based on the idea of a termite mound. Yeah, and it was just a mirror for this idea of, you know, we got to cooperate or else, you know, or else we, we, we either, we either, um, you know, fail or we, you know, make 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 a go of it. And so the termite mound was just sort of this, you know, metaphor for for working, kind of working in concert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if I can ask, I'm just going to ask a couple things. Um, Mark, uh, let's look at these pieces a little closer and then move on. But one of the things I wanted to ask about was these works are on paper. And often in the mm -hmm. past, the other works in the show have all been on panel or canvas. Uh, or linen, and these ones are on paper. Can you talk a little bit about that choice? Um, and just, and then we can kind of move on to the next one. But um, I also wanted to mention that these are the reclaimed te textile on paper, and they are each um, 33 by 38 inches. Frank. Thanks. Uh, yeah, they're, well, they're composed that way. So um, they're, I, I create, I use this sort of translucent tissues and uh, then I saturate with them with glue, and then they create a kind of nice um, backing then to to assemble all these little pieces, uh, geometric pieces of fabric there. They're all cut in miter. So if you see a square, it's actually a, a four different pieces of fabric. So it's a line of fabric, a stripe, and then it's cut into four pieces and mitered at 45 degrees, and then it becomes a square. So anyway, in this assembly process, it's really necessary to have this um, a, a very sticky or tacky surface. So uh, so I just I put them all together and they're on paper, um, and then eventually the the residue gets cut away and they're mounted on canvas. But uh, I be I became just kind of interested in how they looked uh, just mm -hmm. on the paper themselves. The idea that they were floating, you know, that there was no background, there was nothing. So, uh, so you know, I thought, well, these would be really interesting just to keep on the the backing, and then you have this really solid um, solid material, very dense material, uh, where the where the fabric is actually um, you know uh, applied, and then and that is thus juxtaposed against this more fluid, ephemeral looking uh, transparent surface. So I love just it. Kind of a, oh, so I did, sorry. I was just gonna say, let's move on to the next image. Oh, can, I, then, I wanna ask one question. Oh, course, we can go to the next we'll, image. Are we going yeah, to the phalanstery? Um, the, I would think the, um, yeah, we were gonna go on to the, um, the city as the star, um, but, but we can keep, please ask your question. Well, I, if we could go to the phalanstery, I would love to know, uh, I'm mm -hmm. very curious about the, these bullseyes that show up in the middle of all of this geometry. Yeah, so the I feel like sometimes, the phalanstery is the one on the opposite side of the room that's similar, framed in a similar, similar way. Yeah. Go ahead, Linda. They make me feel like there's an eye looking back at me. Like there's yeah. a kind of an all seeing eye that is responding to me as the viewer. Is there anything to that or am I fantasizing yeah, well, here? Uh, just for some background, that this is from a diagram. You mentioned that I like working with systems, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I like working with found shapes, found forms. So this is this is a uh, this image, this uh, collage is based on the floor plan for one of Fourier's phalansteries, you know, communal living structures. And and um, in you know in the original plan, it was absolutely perfectly perfectly symmetrical. But I just couldn't quite I couldn't make myself do it. I had to make it a little off. Uh huh. A little wabi-sabi. Yeah, but then the um, the circle that's a central a atrium where people would come to meet, have meetings, have communal meals, and so on. And um, so, so there was in a, the diagram, uh, a, a basically original diagram or original architectural plan, there was a circle. 
but as I continued working with it, it became kind of a lens, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of looking back at me. Uh, I'm looking at it. It's looking back at me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it became kind of a, during, you know, thinking about all the social isolation, it became kind of a companion or huh. my way to see out. And uh -huh. then uh, this kind of maybe desire for other people to, to see in mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of, you know, in conversation. So it's uh -huh. almost like a lens. Can, can you go back to tell us more about how you stumbled upon Fourier? Oh yeah. Uh, he was just one of the, he was just one of the many um, uh, social theorists who, uh, who had, you know, pioneered this idea of, of, of uh, communistic societies. Um, and then um, I, I had just read about his, his work in a, you know, a book that addressed uh, several of them. Uh, Paradise mm -hmm. Now was one book that I had read. I'd read an earlier book by, uh, written at the time um, in, you know, 1875 by Charles Nordoff about some of these societies. And, and Fourier was, He's he's a relatively obscure figure, but uh, people go back and look at him. He, mm. he, his ideas were just so outlandish, you know, that um, he he was not taken so seriously. But mm. um, when you really de you know really look at him, you know, it's got some interesting ideas. I loved it. I loved it when you told me um, that he came out of a out of a tradition. His profession had to do with being in the textile industry. That's a very nice parallel with your own um, studio practice. Yeah, well, he was born into an affluent family, and then uh, the family lost its fortune for some reason. Then he worked; uh, he had to work, and he worked. He apprenticed in the textile trade, and then um, and then basically spent financed his whole writing career just by working, like going mm -hmm. every day and working in a shop. And so he was involved in the textile trade. If yeah. I can interject for one moment, I'm gonna. Um, I, I meant to mention earlier, but um, if you're in the audience, you are welcome to type in in the comment section and ask some questions. And we actually have one from mm -hmm. the audience about the ideal pairs. And so I know we kind of jumped from ideal pairs over to fill and But if we go back to ideal pairs for one second and then continue on to the city as star, um, I wanted to ask this question. And the person from the audience asked um, if ideals pairs was meant to be an inverted pair. Actually wondered that too. That's a great question. For Mark, I mean, wondering if that's, uh, did you think of them as an inverted pair? Um, you mean the one against the other? Uh, one. Well, I, I guess we can't ask our our per, uh, person, but they're, they're kind of inverted. Um, one is top heavy and one is bottom heavy. So absolutely. And, and I, I, that was very intentional just, just to kind of keep it going. <laughs> For myself, um, uh, I, I was very, very definitely working with them. So there, there's pairing within the composition, but they're always also paired with one another. Mm -hmm. And yes, they are inverted. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Yeah, it is a great question, isn't it? Well, I'll let you guys continue on, and we can look at the city as a star um, to the left. Um, but I, I just wanted to also mention that if people do have who are watching do have questions, they are welcome to ask them, and I'll be checking the comment thread periodically and. When, when possible, interjecting and asking questions. So let's look at this one for a minute and continue with the, on with the rest of the conversation. This, this piece actually reminds, it makes me think of a conflation of your termite mound pieces with the, um, the night sky piece that you did for the Hoffman Gallery. It's, I'm very curious to know what made you overlay the star, the star shape over this kind of insect dome shape. Sure. Well, that yeah, that dome shape. You think of um, a beehive, mm -hmm. or you think of a termite mound. It's 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 become my symbolic city, my, mm -hmm. my symbolic yes. community. Mm -hmm. And then um, the star is uh, basically a, a grid that I had seen from a utopian rendering of of an idealized city. And then, if you of course, if you think about Washington D.C., it's um, oh. it is spoke like. And then, and then there are major avenues that lead into kind of the central. And this idea of equal access, you know, mm -hmm. everybody can get there. There, there. There's a clear path to get to the heart of the city. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then just you know, with all of the in terms of of, of social justice issues, you know, uh, 
there's just all this turmoil in our cities and and there's just so much rancor and there's so much the cities are so maligned you know and and but they're 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 breathing wonderful organisms and people are doing amazing things and and people are kind of in the community working as hard as they as they can and and so you just want to you know you want to credit the city the city's a great thing it's it's got trouble <laughs> certainly but um there, you know, uh, we need the cities, and uh -huh. and so it's this again. It's it's this sort of ultimate desire for for a, a kind of harmony and acknowledging, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that people are working and doing the best they can. Uh, um, your show at the Hoffman Gallery was all about the family as a community. It was all about uh, the connectivity between family members and how one generation. Um, connects with the next generation. And um, this show seems like you've, you've broadened the scope to include like the entire community. But uh, I, I loved y your artist statement that's on the viewing room. Actually, uh, it's a great artist statement. If I were still teaching uh, curatorial affairs, I would make students read it because it's actually kind of my ideal of what I wanna know about from an artist about his or her work. But, um, you mentioned your own upbringing. Uh, I know you were raised in a small community and you were part of a Protestant church, um, that there was a lot of nurturing and and uh, mutual support in the community that you were raised in. Um, do you think that's impossible? Like, are you concerned about that model and how that could be um, visualized either in reality or in um, a visual way? Well, it's uh, you know I I, I live a pretty uh, secular life. Um, the people that I associate with now are, are fairly private about their spiritual lives, but um, uh, the the community, the church community that I grew up with, was very tight knit, and there was this wonderful kind of mutual support. And it's always it's always kind of been there with me, and I think that it's possible. You know, it's possible beyond. You know, people form communities around all different types of issues. Of course, and uh, there are communities of faith, and there are communities built around uh, aesthetics, art. Yes, <laughs> for instance. of course. And uh, and and so you know, people gravitate there, and um, and it's the it's the intersectionality that I think is really you know important. How how do you adhere to your own community, but then um, welcome other communities? How do you intersect, and how do you how do you kind of make how do you make space in the room for 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 people yes. that are kind of from these for, from these other groups and that's a, that's you know that's a that's a big question i suppose it's very broad but that's always something that's that that interests me oh and, i would um, say so too i would say that inter that the idea of interconnectivity between yeah people has been a light motif for the the past 25 years that i've been looking at your work right and and it's real. I mean, it's um, it's kind of a driving, kind of a driving interest in my in my uh -huh. life. And I teach at a community college, and so yes, you know, you you know, you 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 have everybody ev representing the, like all different social, uh, the whole different, the whole social spectrum, and everybody's everybody's got a right to be there. Everybody's got a place, and then you mm -hmm. find a way, you find a way to. You know, to get along and to kind of meet people, um, and and find some commonality. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of just there, and um, you know, it, it just becomes kind of you know it, this general kind of part of one's you know outlook. Mm -hmm. So, um, but but I think it's really important um, from a philosophical standpoint um, in terms of religious philosophy. You know, if we're, if we're talking about religion. You always, uh, I think, you always leave uh, room for self-doubt, or you always leave room for self-doubt. Therefore, you can accept other mm -hmm. ideas, other other ways of thinking. And I think it was uh, Derrida, the you know the the the, uh, the post-structuralist philosopher Derrida. Um, said, uh, he read a lot of religious texts, and he he would say, at the heart of every religious text, there's there's room for self-examination and room for doubt. And that's what allows this kind of exchange or interchange. Otherwise, otherwise there's, you know, people don't get along. 
so well, I, I, that's that's kind of been that's been kind of an influence for me. Well, it seems to me that it's also a route toward empathy, which is um, a, a building block of community. I would I would think. Right. Uh, right. As long I have been looking at your work for the past twenty five years, we've known each other longer than that, but I've been very serious about keeping track of what you're doing and um, always completely delighted by it. And uh, you love a system. You love studying a system, whether it's the the golden mean or utopic societies. And I always feel like those systems that you become entranced by become your prompt. And from yes. that prompt, you very intuitively respond and then activate or actuate a visual object based on this intuitive response to these systems. Do you think that's a fair assessment? Yeah, um, I I love a prompt. <laughs> I you know I need I need a prompt, but yeah, I, I like to start with something that's there and then respond to it, and um, and then then within within that kind of you know it, it it creates a kind of limitation, and then you try to work within that limitation and find some really creative avenue to um, uh, you know find something new through. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so yeah, that's just been a way of working, uh, um, and it's a way to stay connected somehow, to not be so much in my own head, but to try mm -hmm. to bring in the outside world and 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 respond to it in a certain way. Artists are in their head all the time, and it's good during the pandemic. You have something to do, right? Yes. <laughs> but, then it's, but then you don't want to become so self-absorbed that you uh, that you're not connecting and you're not reaching out in some way. So, working with a system that's the sort of out there, it, it just means, you know, I'm trying to, you know, bring bring the external world into what I'm doing. Can we go to the, can we go to the piece called Northern, the Northern Crown? Yeah. Yeah, let's that's, do that. Let's, that's a swivel, lovely... let's swivel around and look at the, the Northern Crown, the large constellation piece. Um, and if I, while I'm, while I'm chatting, I, mm. there's another question from the audience, if I can interject. And um, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, so Linda Mantel, thank you for that question earlier, the one about the inverted pairs. Um, and then um, I just wanted to pass along, I don't know if Mark, if you're seeing comments, but SJ from Seoul, South Korea has said hello. I don't know if you want to say hi. And then Karen Esler has asked a, couple, a question. Oh, and hi, Karen. She said, I'm interested in the dichotomy of the softness, quote, feminine, nature of the materials and the mm -hmm. angular non curvilinear quote masculine treatment of the materials so at some point you if you're interested you might want to comment on that oh that's that's, that's a hard one that uh, is but but at first i want to i want to say hello to my friend uh sung jun jo who's in seoul right now and um he we went to school together uh 35 years ago something like that <laughs> new york city and it's so wonderful that you know that's a great thing about uh, an online mm -hmm. talk is that you know your friend halfway across the world can can tune in so yeah, hello to sun june <laughs> lovely um so uh in the in regard to the question about the the masculine this and feminine you know i haven't really given it a lot of thought but the the, there's just a, an attraction on my part to the softness of the material. Um, when uh, when I, I'm trained as a painter, when I made paintings with paint, I always felt like what someone was looking over my shoulder. I just it just felt uh, I felt kind of like an imposter um, with the fabric. Um, I never thought about gender in re, in relation to the fabric. It's something I was just kind of responded to, but but uh, it's just, it, there's this beautiful quality, it's material and say you cut the fabric, it's the same all the way through. It's, it's not just a surface or a membrane, it's, it's substance, it's body. And so I'm drawn to that kind of softness or the density of it. Mm. And, and um, so it's a very tactile kind of, you know, se sensitive, intuitive thing. But I have to say that um, uh, I've always been um, fascinated by um, regalia, uniforms, mm -hmm. stripes. Uh, the big thing in my community growing up was Friday night football. So you'd you'd go to this uh, stadium, uh, illuminated beautifully with lights, and there'd be these wonderful color combinations of uniforms. Um, 
uh, where you know you would just wonder what what are the teams going to be wearing, and that was that was enough for me to want to be uh, in the sports just because I love I love the colors and the uniform. So there's that. I suppose that's the the. I, I, you can't. That's not. That's non-gender. That sort of interest because it applies to both genders. But you know, I I can't say much more about that. But it's a really interesting question. I I have to. I I find the com the question interesting in the context of the the French philosopher that you've referred to in the work. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and that and that that it was all about gender gender equality and finding this marriage of the masculine and the feminine. Uh, traits and that everything would be complementary and create a harmonious whole. And it's interesting that there's this kind of question and this connection between the masculine and feminine mm -hmm. in the work. So thanks, Karen, for that question. But um, I know that Linda, you were steering the conversation. I think you were steering the conversation towards talking about the ideas um, of um, this piece. Why don't we? Well, hear I a love this more. piece. Of, yeah. of course, um, the title tips you off to the idea that it's it's a uh, an abstracted constellation of some sort. Yeah, um, and it reminds me so much of the piece that you did at the Hoffman Gallery, uh, the night sky, where the visitor would actually lay down in a recliner and then look up into the ceiling and see these incredible star shapes. These, this constellation on the ceiling. It was the most beautiful and meditative use of space. Um, and this piece really reminds me of that experience. But it also. Um, it's also linked to Fourier, some of Fourier's ideas about science and about the way the cosmos works. Do sure. you mind talking a little bit about that? Because I think that's really interesting. Yeah, well, well, Fourier was the prompt and and certainly it's, it's a constellation and then, and I suppose that's all the audience needs to know about it. This kind of connected, these connected stars. But um, in terms of Fourier, he believed that, <laughs> he believed that the borealic fluids uh, above the North Pole would um, at some point um, connect uh, and the Earth would, uh, the Earth, Earth would uh, equalize its, itself on its axis and then the uh, borealic fluids would connect to, to create a complete ring and therefore uh, forming a crown, therefore form a crown over the Northern Hemisphere, which would in turn warm uh, the planet uh, to the extent that um, cultivation would be possible and there would be more food production and then people wouldn't go hungry. And so in, in, in reading about his work, you know, uh, I, and he called it, basically he just called it the, uh, the Northern crown. This is, this is what he, he mm. uh, believed would, would happen in, in, you know, uh, in a later stage in, in, you know, in the Earth's development. So um, in reading about that, I thought, well, that's really a cool idea, but it's, you know, I want to connect it somehow to reality. It's aspirational. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen, but it's really a great idea. <laughs> and maybe one could, you know, uh, it, it's happened in terms of climate change, certainly. <laughs> the, yes, the world is very interesting. Warming, uh, not necessarily for the better, but um, I found uh, just in looking about that, I found something that's kind of grounded in reality. There is a there is a constellation in the north called Coronis Borealis, which is in fact a northern crown and it's shaped like a crown. So I just used that diagram of, of the constellation and then that gave me license then to just make that make that artwork. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's amazing. This is quite a large piece. This is 96 by 120 inches. So right. it's, you know, it's, it's an eight by 10 feet. It's a big, big piece. Um, yeah. But, uh, and, Linda, Linda, you asked about it kind of connecting to that piece from the Hoffman show several years ago. And um, Mark, I think there is actually a, is a connection, isn't there? Yeah, the, 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 the stars which were uh, in the other exhibition, it's hard to describe something that no one can see, but in the other exhibition, they were, they radiant, they were radiant and they were light in the middle and they radiated towards dark. These are light on the outside, and then they radiate towards dark in the middle. And that's because some of these are the negatives <laughs> of the other, you know, the fabric negative of the other pieces that I made. Each time you cut a section of fabric, then oh, it thanks. leaves a negative shape to make a, to make a circle. If you cut a straight line into a circle, there's a negative shape that's left out. So these are the negative shapes from that other project. Like the offspring so, of a former project. Yeah. Yes, but, um, absolutely. 
so the Fourier's ideas had absolutely no basis in science. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, do people in during his time think that he was a bit of a crackpot? Um, and I'm wondering how the surrealists responded or, or people interested in science fiction would have responded to his ideas. Well, uh, I'm certainly not a scholar, but I had read that the, the surrealists did, did really take up his ideas because they were so outlandish. And some people speculate that he coded his writing with a lot of outlandish theories so that people wouldn't, uh, ne wouldn't steal from him, um, huh. you know, wouldn't steal his ideas. Huh. Uh, um, so, so he's, uh, I, I kind of lost, I, I lost my train of thought in terms of your question, but um, can you, uh, can well, you go back <laughs> about um, about how these are like offspring from a past project, or about how Fourier was a bit of a he must have been a little bit of a crackpot, and I'm very curious to know how his contemporaries, either um, creatives that were interested in science fiction or the surrealists, responded to his ideas. Right. Okay. So he did have some. He was acknowledged by Karl Marx when he was writing his. Uh, uh, writing his manifesto. Um, he influenced, obviously, uh, uh, this utopian movement, which was a really big deal in the U.S., because uh, European, mostly communities of faith, were escaping Europe so as not to be persecuted, um, and there needed to be a model. He, along with Robert Owen, were these architects. Even though they weren't necessarily direct architects, they were the ones that started this this conversation, and then a journalist like Horace Greeley um, started, hmm. you know, writing about that, looking for social, you know, social justice, mm -hmm. equity, uh, all of those things, and um, and then it just kind of took off in the U.S. for a period of time. So, in the, you know, uh, and the idea of you know communistic communities was it was a suspicious idea back then too, but then. You know, com you know, if you a communist communistic just means you're you're in a community, and that you know that's a good thing. So it's just basically mm -hmm. how how the word is branded or the content is branded, and how people employ it. You know, yes. whether it's a cudgel or whether it's got, it's kind of describing something that's to aspire for. But yes, that just happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's let's also look at the other two sutured pieces, the sutured circle and the sutured diamond, while we continue talking. About the conversation. I love the idea of this idea of the commons and how it we yeah. we now think of uh, in a particular way uh, the you know the where communism is so uh, branded a specific way because of history. Mm -hmm. But um, you know I think that's interesting going back to the root of it being the common yeah. space and that that being the origin. Well, yeah. not everything about communism is bad. I mean, um, I know I dream of the day when we have socialized medicine. Um, so I think uh, some of these ideas about some of these words about community can be so loaded. Um, and it's I, I think now is the time in our community to kind of take a new look at the way we use language as it pertains to the way we live in community. Right. Right. On so many levels, obviously. Right. Yeah. The one the the um, constellation was probably probably a good one to end on because these pieces are. It's essentially an iteration of the, you know, the the first piece that we looked at, um, just using different geometries. So each of each each side of this is a phalanx of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like a voting block or a voting district is is a formation. It's a phalanx. It can be used either to um, uh, organize, give people a voice, or it can be used as kind of like a wet. It can be weaponized. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the idea is that it has to work in concert with other. It has to work in concert with other formations uh, in order to to make any sense or to be complete. You know, so so uh, just just sort of using these very simple geometric forms to get at the same idea. Um, and. Um, for those in, you know, involved in color theory, they're basically complementary pairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, blue and orange, and um, and um, red and green, and so on. Um, essentially, complementary pairs. So opposite on the color spectrum. Well, you know, we're getting. I I don't want to cut us off, but we're getting to about fifty minutes. So I'm thinking, um, why don't we have so just some kind of overall. 
sort of views of the whole gallery installation as a whole, kind of spanning the whole space. And maybe you, um, if there's any questions from the audience, uh, this is the last, your chance to put them up there on the comment page. And maybe Linda or Mark, do either you have some kind of um, points or questions or kind of to, to um, kind of cap our conversation? Well, for me, this is such a great example of art imitating life because Mark, I think you've just done a beautiful job of kind of encapsulating some of the ideas that, that we've all been, um, that have been stewing for all of us over the last many months. And uh, I don't know, it's very, I think it's a, it's a very healthy thing to uh, think about our communities in ways that are really actually purely visual and abstracted. Well, um... Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think just going back to the idea that you want to leave it um, open enough that people can mm -hmm. enter. You don't want to. You don't want to close anybody out. You want to always leave room. Um, some people might be um, not engaged because it's abstract. It's representative, but it's but it's visually very abstract. So um, you know, hope, you know, if 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 there isn't any kind of connection. Uh, with the idea, hopefully there's a tactile connection, you know, like mm. looking at quilts. They're beautiful. Yes, there's always, like a story quilt. Yeah, there's always the there's always the visual, and there's always just the kind of tactile beauty of the thing, if nothing else. So, try yes. just trying to leave it open for people to find some sort of um, way to connect. Well, big congratulations! It's a, an absolutely stunning show. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah, I think so too. It's been really fun working with you to put bring the show together and the rest of the team at the gallery. And it's um, you know the we we did our studio visits and you know because of the moment we live in, we did our studio visits digitally or over you know FaceTime kind of thing instead of in person. And so I knew this was going to be a very impactful mm -hmm. and powerful, visually powerful show. Um, just from what I had seen, but it, there's just nothing like seeing them in person. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel so lucky to get to, to do that um, on a regular basis here at work uh, at the gallery. Um, I wanna thank you both so much for taking time this evening. Uh, Linda, thank you so much for your time and joining us for this conversation and bringing your uh, history with Mark to this conversation. And Mark, thank you so much for your incredible work. Um, I'm just gonna, um, and thank the audience for joining us. Um, and please, if you enjoyed the conversation and you think um, someone else will have enjoyed it that you don't know if they saw it, please send them the link. Uh, it'll be um, on YouTube and on Facebook. Please share it. And Mark, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just wanna, um, I, I witnessed just how much effort went into putting this program together. So I just wanted to thank you, Daniel, mm -hmm. and Kathleen Murney uh, and the Elizabeth Lee staff. and. Billy, who's operating the camera, and Linda, thank you so much for for taking the time to mm. to you know um, ask me questions <laughs> and and uh, and be in conversation. And then uh, I just want to thank people for tuning in. Um, so I really appreciate. Uh, I, I feel very lucky and fortunate to have this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Mark. The the work is stunning and we're happy to uh, be showing it. I mean, it's exciting to be 25 years into our working relationship with you and presenting this work. Um, I'm just gonna mention again, this is Mark R. Smith and Linda Tesner, and I'm Daniel Peabody from Elizabeth Leach Gallery. And um, we are talking about Mark Smith's exhibition, Phalanxes, which is on view October 1st through November 28th here at Elizabeth Leach Gallery in Portland, Oregon. Um, our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 10.30 to 5.30 by appointment or a knock on the door if you're in the neighborhood. Um, to make an appointment, you can call the gallery or email the gallery and the, um, the email and phone number are there on the screen. Um, so I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. And um, it looks like most people's comments at this point are just thanking us for doing this and talking about how much they love the show. Uh, Mark, I hope you have a chance to uh, see those comments at some point, um, and because um, there's quite a few of them. And I want to thank you both so much for joining us and to the audience. Thank you so much for Here's joining us. Here's a virtual us. toast. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I'll, I'll you yes, a virtual thank toast you. Of water. <laughs> Bye All for right. now. Thanks, everyone. Okay, goodbye. Yes.